Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Conversations in Pop Culture, where I have with me professional wrestler Delmi Exo, who has held several tag team titles with Ashley Vox as part of Team Sea Stars in Shimmer, in Sabotage Wrestling, Battle Club Pro, wrestled in a variety of other places beyond Shine, and everywhere else, pretty much Chikara, which we may or may not be able to say. So, welcome. <laughs> You're doing great. That was great. Professional. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, that's what we're all about. We're all about professionals. So, welcome, pretty much. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, I am excited because, as I stated, we're going to be talking a lot about tag team wrestling. Obviously, anybody who knows you knows that you primarily team up with Ashley Vox with a few variations for the most yeah. part in the last five years. So I think the perfect place to start is how did this team come about? Because you both started around the same time, came in around the same time, and the team just almost naturally formed right from the start. Yeah. Uh, so me and Ashley are actually sisters. I, okay, you know that. Right? I'm like, oh, dropping a bomb on you. Okay, so we're sisters. Uh, growing up, we always played video games together and watched wrestling together. Um, whenever we played wrestling video games, we would always tag because we weren't good enough to, like, beat the computer. <laughs> so we would tag and we would kind of just, like, run around away from the people. And that was how we played wrestling. Um, so we just always had the idea, like, oh, when we grow up, we'll tag. Uh, we stopped watching wrestling when, like, Cena was, like, winning every night. <laughs> we got kind of bored of it. And we tried watching ECW when it had come back, but it was just too much. And so we kind of stopped watching wrestling for a while. When we did start, that was when we were like, Ashley was full on. And she was like, oh, I want to go back and like train to be a wrestler. I showed up with her her first day of class. And when the trainer was going around asking who was going to start wrestling, he asked me. And I was just like, yes. So I signed up that day. Um, and then we just always told him, we were like, oh, we want to tag. We want to tag. He didn't think we'd be able to because there wasn't a lot of female wrestlers in our area which is new england at the time there was probably like five other girls so it it wasn't really like a real idea to have a tag team women's wrestling division in that area and so we got the opportunity with blitzkrieg pro with their debut show the promoter jeremy leary he was like hey, I heard you guys had this idea for a women's tag. I think it'd be interesting. So he let us tag there and brought in two other girls from uh, New York and Connecticut to wrestle. And from there, we've just been kind of like sticking with tagging and then also doing our own singles things. Yeah, and we're just going to really talk about tagging. There's so much to cover in the last five years with the two of you. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm really just curious, what is that like though to team as a family? Because we see it very much on the male side where brothers are tagging or even tag teams are portrayed as brothers. But we don't really see female family members, cousins, sisters teaming together. And so what is that experience like? Because it sort of changes the dynamic a little bit on how you view wrestling and how that's all taking place. And also, what was the gelling process like? between the two of you because obviously there's family already there and it's already sort of existing yeah uh i think it was really easy uh i feel like because we trained at the same time and we trained with the same person and then if we went out to other schools we were always together so we were picking up the same information and we had the same thought process whenever we like set up matches we have like the same ideas we're like if i'm like trying to formulate a spot for her she's like oh I know what you're going with this like I know what you're thinking of right away so I feel like that really helps um traveling's easy because we lived in the same house so it was just easy to catch the same flight catch the same like car ride up to the airport um I think also like not to like throw shade but like Sometimes when we do call matches with other tag teams, it's like kind of gets awkward because they won't be in agreement with each other. And then me and Ashley just have to kind of like <laughs> twindle our fingers while we let them like cool off so we can finish like coming together to piece a match together. Me and Ashley like don't fight because we're just so used to each other. 
that if she has like a little attitude, I'm like, okay, she means this. Or if I'm having an attitude, she'll be like, oh, she means this. Like, so we can take over each other's like moods and we don't have to like be fake to each other and be like, I want to do this. They're like, I want to do that. And it's like, it's just a normal (laughs) dynamic where it comes to that. There's no like resentment either because I want her to do good. She wants me to do good in the match we're not trying to like outdo each other in that sense and we also are always like concerned with safety like if she sees that I'm hurt she'll be like stay out for this spot I'll take it or vice versa and we're going to talk about some of those matches and (laughs) co-on and everything but I am curious before we go full into some of these matches and talk about Blitzkrieg for starters where did the name Team Seastars come from because it is a perfect name, and it was almost immediate that it came into existence. And how did that come about? Because now it's sort of synonymous with the two of you. So I came up with the name. (laughs) 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 It's because at the time, I was trying to do like an alien gimmick, and actually I was doing the fish gimmick. So I was thinking, uh, oh, sea, like ocean, and then stars, like the galaxy. And I was like, when I was little, I always called her, you're my sea star? Because I had like a lisp. I was seven years younger than her. So I couldn't talk very well. And she used to hate that. She used to be like, oh, like stop being affectionate. <laughs> like, gross. So I was just like, oh, what if we call ourselves like sea star? And it sounds like sister. <laughs> and then she hated it at first. But it stuck. <laughs> and people liked it. So now she's stuck with it. <laughs> And it works with other things in tag team. I don't know if I can or can't say, but anybody who knows code in wrestling has watched certain promotions, gets it. And we're not going to go into the code because I don't want to ruin anything. But now let's talk about those first few matches. Blitzkrieg obviously gave you a massive opportunity. Ariel and Nix, you wrestled against Maximo Mecca, Tatred and Toxic. Toxics. Can't even speak today. Can't even speak today. It's it, it, S X. It, it's T O X S. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and then you also wrestled against Leva Bates, who was on my show. Ariel Nix was on my show as well in Blitzkrieg, and those were your first few tag team matches. So what was it like wrestling these women? Because Ariel was sort of new at the time, and Leva has been on the scene for a while. So what was that like? And Leva is a well-known name, and she has her gimmick back in the day of cosplaying. And all that stuff that she was doing. So what were those matches like early on? So early on, um, trying to learn tag team wrestling, which in itself is like a whole nother animal. You have like a match that you can put together as singles, but then tag team wrestling. And one like small thing, it just makes it look messy and disgusting. So I think because me, Mecca, Ariella, Ashley, we were all green at the same time there was a very like non-pressure attitude to the matches. Whereas if we went to other shows, they were kind of like forcing us to feel like the show is like going to be like the most important match of your life. And we're like, no, we're green. Like let us mess up. Like it's probably going to be bad, but like, let us try things. (laughs) So with those shows, like at Blitzkrieg and like that area of Western mass, we felt like we could just like mess up and like try things. And it no one was like yelling at us about it all the time or like this match is going to be like the most important match like someone's going to see this and it's like I'm green like (laughs) it doesn't matter when we wrestled Leva she was really nice she's such a sweetheart to work with um we've worked with her after this match but this match was um like we were still very green I think we had only wrestled maybe six months and she like called it all she was like what's your guys stuff and then she just kind of pieced it into like a formula that worked and it was one of our like best matches at that time tagging and probably another match that also helped that happen this year was your diana perrazzo and sumi saki match in new england championship wrestling because obviously sumi was more of the veteran and definitely the most experienced out of everybody in that match and so and Sumi was obviously coming from Japan and had that background and it's been around 
for a longer time. So what was that match like? Because I would imagine it would be similar to just experience and really just providing spots and even insight into wrestling, especially being so green and new and having somebody in the ring who is more experienced from everybody that I spoke to is so much more helpful, especially in yeah. your first year. Um, Gianna and Sumi were also really sweet. Uh, again, it was one of those moments where it's like, what is it that you do? Like, what are your best five things? And then showing us how they would piece a match together and how they would build from like the lowest point of the action to like the highest part and then bringing it back down into the finish. Um, they were very helpful. That was a rare opportunity. We didn't expect that because it was just like a New England championship wrestling show. A lot of people just kind of wrestled people within New England, but it was awesome seeing them bring in two girls from New Jersey who were like veterans at the time and like could actually help us build. And talking about building and getting out there and you got to talk about it and slightly controversial with everything that's going on, but we do have to talk about the Chikara stuff because that was kind of, I think, what really changed the Sea Stars, changed you as a wrestler, changed the Ashley as a wrestler, and two years of massive tag team wrestling where you faced Los Ice Cream, the Gentleman's Club, which is Orange Cassidy, and the Swamp Monster. You were in a match against the Heat X-Men, X-Men reference for you with Icarus, Kodama, Mark, and Galesi, and I can't even say Oben Ryan, or, or I can't even say his name, and you had Ruby Riot and Kimberly on your team as well. It was obviously yeah. men versus women that match. And so let's just talk about those three matches because I think that really showed tag team wrestling, still green, still new, but you're in Chikara. Chikara is obviously one of, at the time, was one of the most well-respected Indian promotions. And these were some great matches and probably massive experience game. So what was that like coming into it and tabling everything that's happened with Chikara in the last three months? I think that experience does carry a lot of weight still as far as your growth goes as a tag team. I'm like, oh man, what am I allowed to say? <laughs> Cause I'm like, uh, people wear masks. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so the first match, Lowe's ice creams match. So the person who wrestles as Lowe's ice cream, when I first met them to wrestle them, ah, this is going to be difficult. <laughs> so person, Lowe's ice creams, uh, the way I like, we first walked up to them to start calling the match. They had like an iPad and with like their ideas. And I was like, I want to be that because <laughs> it was just so organized. And they were like very like uh, not pompous in a bad way, but just like eloquent. <laughs> so if anybody knows who Los Ice Cream are, you know, they are a great tag team. Yeah. And, and I'm not going to I'm not going to say names. You know, you know, obviously anything that I said and I don't reveal names. It's one of those rules in Chikara and Lucha Libre. It's very much other promotions operate a similar way as well. So what was it like working with them? Because obviously they've been around and they have done some amazing things in Chikara. And they're a fascinating team. And also they're, they're a fun team because, I mean, they're, they're, their gimmick is ice cream. <laughs> it's kind of a fun thing to have in there. So... I think it was a good mentorship uh, right there, like calling the match. But uh, I think me and Ashley definitely walked away after we like finalized all the thoughts and like the blueprint. We were just like, uh, like, can we handle this? Like, I don't think I don't think we can handle this. And we had to like keep calling it to ourselves, like back and forth, back and forth, which is another good thing with like tag teams is like me and Ashley can like share our insecurities together without feeling like awkward or like the other person's gonna laugh at you like we'll constantly go back and be like I can't remember this and like talk through it over and over again until we like have it I would say that match was like the hardest one from Chikara because of it being our first tag match and like us assuming like oh my god like we're gonna fuck up everything like we're here. this is a lot to handle as like green kids um, moving on up from that, we got to wrestle in that four-on-four -four match. And 
that was fun. We rode up to Canada that day. And then we wrestled on the first show. We then had to wait for the second show to happen. Chikara did like a double header for themselves. So um, we were exhausted driving back home. I accidentally fell asleep in the car. And Batiri never lets me hear the end of that. <laughs> they will Every time they see me, they're like, oh, are you going to sleep? Are you going to go to sleep? <laughs> every time <laughs> because I did that. Um, that match was intense as well. Um, I feel like... The level of energy in the room was just chilling because we were tagging with Kimberly and Heidi Lovelace at the time. And they were just over, like, over the moon over. (laughs) So the crowd was going crazy for them. And, like, feeling that directly was just, like, intimidating. And uh, it was probably, like, our best match we had in Chikara as a team, if I would say that, like. That was probably, like, my favorite tag match. And speaking about Kimberly, Jakar is known for trios matches, and you had a match against Kimberly where she teamed up with Lost Ice Creams, and you had Solo Darling, who was on your side. So what was that like? Because obviously tag team wrestling is one thing with you and your partner, but then when you had a third person in there, things get interesting in Jakara in that and obviously it's solo and solo's been around and solo sort of reinvented herself in Chikara in many ways so what was it like getting to wrestle Kimberly on the other side having teamed up with her and then also having solo on your side and going up against her or not going up against her but going up against the other side with her because she's a fascinating wrestler um that was towards the end where we knew Kimberly was kind of on her way out uh, to start like her first round with WWE. So it was really emotional. Uh, me and Ashley were like, kind of like, oh, like I want to be in the ring with her. Like we wanted to be in the ring with her more than we got to be. Um, but there was like something with the storyline where like Kimberly couldn't be aggressive. I like can't remember it because it was so long ago, but it was something where like, there's some storyline where she couldn't be too aggressive to us because she was still like very much a baby and she was trying to go out as a baby face. So we didn't get to do enough (laughs) with Kimberly, which is heartbreaking. Um, Now that she's on the indies and like with TNA, hopefully we'll be able to cross paths more often, but uh, we felt like we didn't get to grasp enough with her Um, working with solo. I feel like me and Ashley work really well with Solo because she, uh, we kind of have the same personality since we're all Mexican. So <laughs> it's like a very fun di- dynamic whenever we're around Solo. She's just so energetic. <laughs> and it, I feel like she brings out the best in both of us. And speaking about energetic matches, Trikara does some interesting things every once in a while. And they brought in DX into a crazy gauntlet match. You were a part of it. I don't know how much you were a part of it, how much interaction you had with DX, but nonetheless, and this was, I think, Billy Kid or Billy Gunn, and X-Pac, I think, was in this match, from my understanding, yeah. and what, what I've seen and what I remember of this match, and a variety, pretty much half the locker room, if not all of the locker room, was in this match, pretty much. Because why, why wouldn't they be? If DX is in the map, I mean, God forbid, right? So what was that experience like with DX being at a show and that being thrown out there and you being involved in it and having a crazy tag team match in Chikara and the weight that everything carries? And I mean, were, were you a degenerate at the very least? Uh, I'm a huge DX fan. I'd get in trouble because my mom used to spray sheet. Uh, spray paint shirts for me that said suck it (laughs) I'd get in trouble at school um I took a picture with them I know you're not supposed to when you're like at shows you're supposed to be like oh hi and like respectful but I was like oh my god can I take a picture with you (laughs) because I don't know when I'm gonna see them again so I got a picture with DX (laughs) super stoked I wrestled right before I think it was like me and Ashley went out and then I think we maybe won one match and then stayed for another. I can't really remember. Or maybe we just got out one match. I remember it was the Gentleman's Club. Um, Orange Cassidy and Drew Gulak. 
Um, so we had enough time to like watch their entrance. So as soon as we finished, we like rushed to the back and we were like waiting in the stands, like behind the curtains, like waiting for their entrance. And when the music hit, everyone just lost their mind. (laughs) And like, so did we, but like the best like pop ever. I think that's the loudest pop I've ever heard was DX entering. It's crazy. It's crazy. And now I kind of want to fast forward and talk a little bit about Women's Wrestling Revolution. Because you've been involved with that promotion for almost four or five years, really from the start. I think you came into their promotion around 2016 and you really haven't left. And you've had a variety of matches. And one of the first matches was a match with Davian, Mistress Belmont, and Sammy Lane. And I know that Davian and Mistress Belmont are very much in the Massachusetts, New England, chaotic championship wrestling scene. So what was that like, wrestling them and going up against them? And Mistress Belmont's been around forever, and she's been doing this shit for way too long. And she was also on my show. That, that's why I'm bringing her up, because she is fantastic. So, and, and the insight she has in wrestling and how she called Sasha Banks and was wrestling her when she was Mercedes. So what was that like being in that match? And Solo was with you facing yeah. as well. Um, it was all right. <laughs> Definitely overwhelming. I wouldn't say that's like one of our most proud matches. We kind of were like very green to be in that situation. And like the environment of the crowd being around the ring kind of heightened the anxiety of the match. I don't think it came off as good as when we called it in the back. And that's just me being honest because I'm always like critical towards matches like that. I think for what it was, like introducing us into a bigger scene was a great opportunity because we got brought back, obviously. But I do like, I remember when we like had the match, there were so many people who were like giving us feedback, like, Oh, like, this could have looked better. Like, this could have looked cleaner. So it kind of defeated us a little having that match. And we were like, oh, like, we're the shits. (laughs) But um, obviously we got brought back to WWR and we had more time to improve. But that was one of the matches that was, like, kind of a low for us. It was, like, yeah, (laughs) not. not Let's talk about you being brought back. Because I think one of the things and one of the matches that I really liked, and I felt that it opened up a few doors was that Maria Manic and Penelope Ford match. And you have had a few matches with them that have crossed other promotions. Queens of Combat, I believe you faced them, and a few others. And obviously, Maria Manic scares the shit out of me. Scares the shit out of me. Penelope Ford makes me feel okay. (laughs) It's just, just the exact opposite. And so, what was it like? Because clearly... Both of those women are beyond talented. They are where they are for a reason. And at the time, they were starting to get attention and starting to build traction. But they are two tough chicks, for for lack of a better word. And so what was that like? And there's some history and obviously facing them again and multiple times. And so because I felt like that was a real fight brought to you. And especially Maria Manic, uh, in that sense. So what what was that all like and playing it out and then getting to face them a second and third time? So I think you've had two or three matches with them. Yeah, I think I've wrestled Maria singles maybe twice or once. I wish I could remember things better. <laughs> um, wrestling them was fun. That was one of our favorite matches. Like the energy was good. Uh, Penelope was over already because she had been getting introduced into Beyond as like a valet and like doing some like high spots with Joey. So the crowd already like kind of gravitated towards her and Maria. But then by the end, I feel like it was like a mutual like, uh, like for both teams. And we just kind of like established that like women's wrestling was its own category and like it could actually stand on its own. Uh, that was one of our like, yeah. favorite matches from WWR. Another one would be like against Team Adams, Tasha Steeles, and Karen Q. And then Talk definitely that one the one with Taylor and Alicia. 
And we, we could talk about the Karen Q and Tasha steals. Obviously, Tasha is with Impact now, and she's had some amazing matches, and she is tough as nails, and she she's great. Karen Q, I think, is with WWE right now. And so what was that like in those matches? Because clearly both those women were probably ahead of their time and what they were doing and what they were putting out there. And you were hanging toe-to-toe with both of those women as a team. And so what what is that like? Because it's the same thing with Maria Manik and Penelope Ford in Queens of Combat as well, where you were clearly hanging toe-to-toe. And anybody who watches those matches, I've seen them. It doesn't seem like a squash match, for lack of a better word. Yeah, um, I would say Karen Q and Tasha Steels. That was a very easy match to call. Um, working with them was very like my energetic. There wasn't like a, any like hidden agendas. They're both nice girls, and like we just called like maybe not in the ring, match. not in the ring. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. They're both very athletic too. So that was fun. It was like working with them on different like kind of lucha, lucha spots. I know Ashley got to do a little more like ground wrestling too because that's like the style she likes. It's like chaining. So that was one of our like favorite matches that we had tagging early on at WWR. And to also just even further go, Alicia Edwards and Taylor Hendricks. I think both of them were, were an impact. Alicia is still with impact. I don't exactly know her capacity, but like her husband is maybe a world champion or something. I don't know. Uh, maybe. I, <laughs> I don't know. I digress. You know, I'm just howling for, for something else. Again, codes, 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 everybody. But what was that like? Because I think at the time that all these matches were happening, Taylor either just left or was on her way out of impact. <clears throat> Alicia was sort of, in, I guess, in the mix. And what is it like when people have credibility and social credibility and that you get to wrestle them? Because to some degree, it does heighten your profile a lot from from a business side and also speaks that this promotion trusts you enough to be in the ring with high profile people. And and I think that even goes back to Tasha Steeles. And I keep on bringing it back to Maria Manic and Penelope Ford as well, where you were trusted by WWR to be wrestling some of the best women in the world. And so as a team, how does that make you feel that you were trusted in that position very early on in your career? Um, That match was a lot of fun. It was probably our stiffest match because of how hard Alicia and Taylor hit. So we felt like we could also bring that level of stiffness and it kind of brought out that like kind of hold back energy that we used to have when you're like green and you're trying not to like get yelled at for certain things where it's like at that point we were just like okay like we know we can hit hard and safe so it was like finally a stepping stone where we could get away from like the training wheels a little bit when it comes to like strikes and things like that um Alicia has been working with us probably like a while so we already knew her from like our days in chaotic so it was super easy to call um, most of it was actually like kind of ad-libbed too. So that's what's fun about like a lot of girls in New England kind of work that style where like it's like in the moment. So we got to do a little bit of that, which was super fun and challenging because unless you're like good, no one's going to actually ad-lib with you or like call things right there and then. They'll just like have to call everything back stage with you. So for them to trust us to be able to like follow along to their lead was a lot of fun. I think we also used a fishnet in that match. <laughs> I'm not mistaken. <laughs> and so what does that make you feel? I think you sort of answered it, but that your opponents trust you because I think people forget that wrestling is very much everybody's got to be on the same page. I hate to put yeah. it somewhat cave face, but everybody's got to be on the same page. Everybody's got to trust one another. And when your opponents trust you enough to say, hey, we're going to go and figure something out towards the end, or that there's a moment where they're like, hey, follow what we're going to do here. Because that, that's kind of a turning point to some degree in your career, when people trust you enough to go out and do that, and your opponents trust you with their safety. And so yeah. 
what 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 did that mean to you on a personal level? Um, personally, uh, I think it was just like nice to see like us be on the same level as Alicia because and Taylor because they were like the top girls that came out of New England. Like Alicia was always like the um, standard because she had been around so long and she had such an accolade behind her of like what she had accomplished. So every girl had to kind of have the match with Alicia. Like that's what it was called. It's like, Oh, if you survive Alicia, then you get to stay in the business. Kind of like the gatekeeper. Like, she's the gatekeeper. Yeah. She, she's you Chris Dickinson or Tony <laughs> Deppin for GCW. We'll go with that. <laughs> yep. That's Alicia. So that, uh, seeing her treat us as equals was like really nice. Um, she also thinks we're Marks because <laughs> we're huge fans of the American Wolves. So every time she sees us, she's like, ah, you Marks. <laughs> That's so bad. That's so bad at so many levels. And then well, we they, they, they were knew still... one of their spots, like, bit for bit. And she was just like, why do you guys know that? Like, I don't even know that. <laughs> but, like, on a joking level, like, she was just like, oh, my God. And moving forward, there is one more match or two more matches I want to talk about from WWR, and that is with Team Bad, which is spelled B C A D, and that's Harlow O'Hara and Tarek Calloway. And there are two matches, one in 2018, one in 2019. Um, both of these women are scary, um, they are bigger. They, they've been around forever. Um, they, they can do some damage. And so what was that like? And uh, yeah, because I think these matches were, were clearly something that was not expected. You know, everything prior to this, I felt was different than these two matches in the style, how they were conducted, who you were wrestling. I, I mean, I hate to say it and it might come out wrong when I say it, but just the image of, of, of everybody standing in the ring was night and day. Styles to some degree are night and day. And you calling me small? <laughs> very much, very much. Um, it, that, that's a nice way how to say it. I'm, I'm trying I to figure out how to be political. I'm trying to figure out how to be very political on this. I take my protein. <laughs> so what was this like and getting to do it again? Because this is something that if done right in wrestling, is really good. And I really enjoyed both of these matches. Yeah. Um, I think uh, what had happened was Drew wanted to use Oceania. So Seastar stopped tagging at WWR for a bit because he wanted to bring in the character that Ashley was doing at Jakar at the time. So there was like a space in between from like our last tag match to those tag matches that ended up happening and um he liked the character but uh he wanted to like bring back the tag team because he wanted to do like the tag team tournament which is why we ended up tagging again we did like this uh gimmick where i had a squash with tara and then ashley came out for the save and rubbed off the oceania face paint and that's how we like kind of joined back together again the first match with Tara and Harlow was the first match that we had to do in that tournament. So we knew going in that we were going to end up working a program. So we kind of saved some things in that match for future matches to hopefully happen. And I think, I think it came out good because me and Ashley do a really good job where we're, if we have to play like the underdog or the little guy, we kind of know how to work our size. We don't just like, I'm going to whip you off now. (laughs) Like we know how to like kind of get the crowd into thinking like, Oh, we're hopeless. Um, (laughs) Which we kind of are, but (laughs) I think they also do a good job of playing up their size and like being dominant and like stiff and overbearing. So I think it did really good. It was a good underdog win for us. That first match. Um, We ended up losing in the second round to twisted sisters that's okay (laughs) but uh later on we did get to work harlow and tara again for a i think it was like a street fight or a grudge match i don't remember what they called it 
And they painted on the door, fish are food, <laughs> that Ashley later went through, which was rude. Harlow misspelled one of the <laughs> one of the words on there, too. So she had to re-spray paint it. <laughs> if you go back and you look at the tape, you'll see the door is just, like, covered in paint. And, like, you can barely tell <laughs> what it's supposed to say. Um... And so to, to talk about that, so w- what is that like to have that underdog win, have that good karma win, have that sort of baby face win, if we'll call it? And then secondly, what is it like to be in a hardcore match? Because those matches can be crazy. You know, doors are one of those things that come out in promotions like Beyond or GCW or WWR and there's a few others. And... A variety of promotions don't use doors. Um, a variety of promotions don't allow people to use weapons. And so what was that experience like? Being able to let loose and have that match and have things like that and have those inside jokes, you know? Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, I always played with, like, street fights on the video games. And, like, you always use, like, all those items. So getting to use them in real life is, like, really fun. Um, because of adrenaline, like, you don't really feel as much pain as you should for the weapons. Like, you're kind of, like, invincible in a bit. So it's like, oh, this is fun. Like, I got hit with a kendo stick, (laughs) finally. Um, they didn't give me a metal trash can. I am very upset about that. I asked for a metal trash can, and they got me a plastic one. So when I went through the trash can, I was just like, (laughs) it's not metal. (laughs) I would imagine it might hurt more if it was plastic. I think they thought that we wouldn't be able to dent them. <laughs> <laughs> which is offensive. <laughs> I can dent a metal trash can. <laughs> I think that's why they did that. <laughs> so we just had the plastic one. <laughs> which I broke. <laughs> well, <laughs> as much as I like talking about it, trash cans and and denting them we're gonna go back to something controversial slightly and and i know i know it did it's so much fun and this actually ties to penelope ford and marina manic to some degree because you got to wrestle the fellow twins which is eddie mcqueen and rick catalano and you did them twice one of them was in queens of combat the other was in queens of combat with girl fight was involved Girl Fight, for those who don't know, is a very cool promotion. And they do a lot of interesting stuff. And I actually really like what they do right now with female wrestling in particular. And tabling controversy. And I love Eddie. Eddie Eddie is fantastic. And he's going to be in a match, I think, at Paris is bumping in, in, in maybe a few weeks, I think. So what was it like wrestling them? Because obviously the fellow twins trained Penelope before they brought up Maria Manic. They trained a few other people and they're they're interesting, for lack of a better word. And th- those matches can be a lot of fun. And if, if anybody's seen their matches, both of them can be a lot of fun in the ring. There's some comedy in there, but there's some really good wrestling in there too. Um I think I think both both matches started with promos like trash talking so me and Ashley were like comfortable or we just hadn't had enough practice talking on the mic in front of crowds because we were still I think we were only two years in when we had those matches so the way they started off was trash talking and I remember the first time you mean throwing shade you mean throwing shade throwing shade I remember the first time we just got like buried like annihilated on the mic (laughs) and then we had to wrestle and like because you're so like trying to be friendly you don't know when it's like good to let go and like oh like the curtain's pulled like you can act now like it's it's fine so then the second time that we had a trash talk me and ashley just like laid it in (laughs) and not hold back and i feel like that kind of like made us get better at like talking trash because you can talk trash as like a heel all day so easy like you don't have to watch what you say but as a baby face like you have to kind of be like smart and like cool and like witty good 
yeah, witty. Like, you can't just, like, be rude or, like, show ass. Like, you have to actually, like, make sense. So I think that kind of helped uh, with those matches. That was definitely the thing that we gained the most was the ability to be, like, baby face, but also, like, not a punk or, like, not just, like, an <laughs> not like a wuss. <laughs> And so what what is that like to really start learning how to cut a promo? Because you were sort of thrown into the water and you had to swim to one side or the other. And so obviously what what I got out of this and I think what everybody who's listening or is going to listen to this got is that that first time was not a great promo throwing experience. And I would imagine that it might have also thrown you slightly off the game in the ring too to some degree because if you – start off a match by cutting a promo and then you go directly into the match. I mean, there's some lack of flow per per se. So what was that like really learning from that experience and having, I think it's safe to say a bad experience, but a teachable one. Um, I think it just like forced me and actually to like get better. I mean, you can cut a promo all day in your room, like, and edit it and it'd be like oh this is like the best promo but when you have to like talk in front of a crowd that is like where you can slip up and just like not be as eloquent uh now we can cut promos in front of the crowd anytime like it's easy uh sabotage gives us the mic sometimes and we just like talk crap about texas (laughs) while we're in texas (laughs) and it's great like it's easy but at the moment um very hard we used to have to cut promos in chikara i remember me and ashley would just like go over what we had to say before we had to get to the camera so we weren't like embarrassed cutting the promo in front of everyone around the room (laughs) them watching us i have trouble saying um tag team champions in spanish and i'm spanish but i could (laughs) not say it and bryce was just like saying it to me multiple times after every take and I was like oh my god I'm so sorry I can't even say it now I won't I refuse (laughs) so I do want to talk about promos because I think this is interesting and I think that and it ties a little bit to social media I think 2020 with everything that's happened is has changed the game slightly with what can be said in a promo now what can be addressed in a promo, what can be said on social media, which is sort of similar to a promo to some degree, or even how social media is now used to further matches or storylines or programs. And so how do you feel that's changed? And I know you've only been in the business for about five years, but clearly I, as a fan, have noticed a massive change in what is acceptable to engage in and I think Jeremy Wyatt put it perfectly, saying you have to know who you're speaking to and you have to know the wrestler you're tweeting at. So you could say certain things to Ricky Shane Page that you can't say to, I guess, I guess, Effie, for, for lack of a, of a better word. And, and I've interviewed Effie, and I, I don't think he's going to mind me saying that, but you could call Ricky Shane Page a fat piece of shit, and it's perfectly acceptable. Or you could yell at Darren Corbin, the same way and tell them Ariana Grande sucks and it's perfectly acceptable, but you can't say certain things to all the wrestlers. So how yeah. do you feel that's changed? Because I felt like in 2019, there was much more freedom in that. And now that has changed in the last six to eight months. And so I'm just curious your perspective from the inside, when we talk about what you can say on a promo and what you can do on social media, because it seems to me that there's been a lot of change in the industry. Yeah, um, I would say, I mean, for starters, if you do cut a promo and you feel like, for like anyone listening who's a wrestler, if you do cut a promo and you feel like maybe there's some things that are like pushing the envelope in a good way, like where they'll get people's attention and be like, oh shit, like these people actually hate each other, send it to maybe the person you're working with and say, hey, is this okay? Like if I post this, like it doesn't hurt to get permission from anyone and a post can always wait. (laughs) <laughs> so always ask permission and like show the person what you're going to say or if you have the idea like hey can I say this in a promo and they say yes then that's totally fine um, I do get annoyed when like there is kind of like a work happening and then fans will get like offended like overly offended 
and try to make like it a bad situation. It's like, no, like you can tell when two people are agreeing to build something up. And like, you can also tell when someone's actually genuinely offended and like kind of, uh, someone else is also doing something very malicious. Um, I would just ask permission. I don't think I've ever said anything that's like pushed the envelope in that regard outside of like who the person was in their life versus who they are in the ring. And um, I think social media is a great tool if you use it right. It can be very tricky though because I mean anyone can get offended with anything nowadays so (laughs) you are walking on eggshells. Um, But I, I don't know. I've like managed to fix my feed so I only see good positive things, <laughs> thankfully. And do you feel though that it has changed in many ways? Because I've noticed that change in the wrestling community, and I'm a fan. And it's very, very odd because eight months ago, wrestling Twitter was very different than it is today. And th- there's a lot of reasons why. That could be COVID nineteen. It could also be that you know things change. Just, just in general, you know, every year there are changes and maybe we're noticing them a lot more because of COVID-19. But I feel that that there's been more changes and that there's been more sensitivity in many ways in the wrestling community than there was a year ago. Yeah, I think there, um, there is like definitely sensitivity. Uh, I don't know if it's because I wasn't like so involved in wrestling before and now that I am like I don't know if it's just because my platform has gotten bigger that social media wrestling has changed um because I wasn't in a lot of the companies that I am in now so seeing social media now I'm like oh it's just because now I'm starting to work for these people or like I wrestle certain people so now I know what they're tweeting about or what they're posting about um back then it was like your world was small to make a promo for a promotion smaller. Like, yeah. nowadays everyone can like if they have a match they'll post a promo yeah. and like i think that's great like you are in control of your own character a little more and now let, let's back out of promos because you imagine that you're involved in bigger companies and i think one of the bigger companies you're involved in is shimmer and a lot of fun stuff's happened in shimmer for you and so I just want to go through some stuff here really quickly. You got to wrestle Tessa Blanchard with Indy Hartwell. And you have some history with Tessa and Anthony Green. Yes, <laughs> that happened. I'm like, what? Yes. <laughs> and so and so, what was it like to getting to do Tessa? There's a good chance she's going to be in WWE sooner rather than later. And you had a few matches with her. So, And she's probably one of the best female wrestlers or will be one of the best sooner rather than later. So what was that like getting to face her a few times? Uh, that was a lot of fun. We didn't think it was actually going to happen because <laughs> something happened with her plane where like a flight had gotten delayed. I think she literally arrived at the venue two matches before we had to go on. It's crazy. So we were very close to just like having the match get canceled completely and not wrestling. So it was a lot of nerve wracking. We called it amongst each other. And then once she got in, we like filled in her stuff and then she kind of like added a little bit more and we went out there Um, (laughs) and hope for the best. She gave us a lot of feedback, which again helped with the whole like level of aggression, like adding more to that because we were still like at a very like, um, we had gotten better since Alicia and Taylor, but now it was more like, now you can be even more aggressive. I think that's the thing with women's wrestling is it's very stiff. <laughs> Guys hit very light. Women hit very stiff because we are smaller. Therefore we have to hit harder. So it looks better. <laughs> and so talking we- about that aggression <laughs> and fast forward into 2019, I believe this was your breakout year as a team where you were involved in the Shimmer Tag Team titles against Mercedes Martinez and cheerleader Melissa. And you had two matches. And one of these matches, you won the titles. And you still have the titles. And so what was that like? Because obviously Mercedes Martinez has been doing this shit way too long. And then cheerleader Melissa is just one of those names that's just dropped in female wrestling. 
in a variety of ways, in a very positive ways, a lad. And both these women are so talented and so gifted. And to have two matches with them, win or lose, is fantastic. And to get the titles off of them, it's kind of sweet, to some degree, is a good way to put it. So what was this experience like capturing the belts and really just having having sort of that booster attached is, is the way I view it? Yeah, um, so we didn't know we were winning the belts until maybe five minutes before we went out. <laughs> and uh, when we found out, like, me and Ashley were trying not to cry. There was, like, a match going on right before us, and we were like, okay, okay, don't cry, don't cry. <laughs> um, cheerleader Melissa is super, super stiff. <laughs> it's great, because I feel like, I don't know, I like aggression. So, like, when you're, like, getting hit hard, it just feels so much more real. Like, the moment, you're just in that moment of, like, it being an actual fight. And, like, everything, like, slowing down and actually, like, bit by bit getting played out in front of the audience. Instead of just, like, a car crash kind of match. (laughs) Whereas, like, the smash was, like, very, like, slow. Like, I feel like, yes, the crowd knew we would have lost. Like, they were like, oh, yeah, like, we we know C-Stars are going to lose. But we were given the moments where, like, they thought, like, oh, they could have won. And then when we did win, it was just, like, (laughs) I don't think the crowd really expected it at all, which was great. I had to do, like, a suicide dive in the ring to break up their lap, their finish. Because, (laughs) like, and it was nerve-wracking because they were, like, Ashley, like, you can't kick out because it's their tag finish that they've always won so they were like, you just can't kick out. Like, you have to break this up. And I was, like, nerve-wracking. And I wanted to break it up, like, close enough where it was just, like, a split second. So once that happened, I think the crowd was just like, what? <laughs> so given that, given milliseconds, if we will, and then breaking it up, you guys winning, having the belts, and obviously Shimmer is very prestigious with everything they do, they have a long history. It's obviously well respected up with Shine and Rise as well, and a few other women's all women's promotions. What was that experience in that position? Because obviously, a lot of people were watching on the internet way more than were at the event. There was a lot of tweeting going on. I remember that match. I bought that match because this was when you have to pay. It's an eye pay per view, so people were fascinated with it. And so what was that entire experience like? And then leaving with the belts and having that prestige and having a real win versus kind of facing a team that isn't up to where you guys were heading and are heading and going and actually having a competitive match is the words I'm looking for here. Yeah, definitely. It was definitely a competitive match. I would say that uh, describes it best. I think, the moment like we won the belts we just like hugged and cried for a while in the middle of the ring (laughs) very embarrassing um we went to the back and like all the girls were there to like shake our hands and hug us and like congratulate us and it was like a great experience and like mercedes hugged us and she was like i'm so proud of you guys that just sent me (laughs) and then like from there it was just always like uh, kind of like embarrassing like you know when like your mom says something like oh I'm so proud of you honey like it was just like mom because everywhere we'd go everyone would be like oh my god you guys are the shimmer champions and we'd be like stop <laughs> and one of the things that I like about you with the belts is that you got to defend those belts against real women competitors you know, mm. Bird and the Bee which is Solo Darling and Will, Willow Nightingale after she returned as well as The Nation, which is Charlie Evans and Jessica Troy, who you have some history with. And so what were these likes? And I'll say this, and I've been saying it, Solo is one of the best wrestlers in the world right now. She's in the top 20 wrestlers on the indie scenes, hands down, um, with what she can do and how she does it in singles and in tag team wrestling. I think she's a better singles wrestler than a tag team wrestler. I really think that. So what was it like getting to defend these belts against some of the best women in the world and really getting competition and getting fights brought to you 
than rather just having easy title defenses? Um, well, we love working Blue Nation because just like the chemistry that we end up building together is just it's some of our favorite tag matches that we've had. We've worked them like two other times before that. So getting to work them again was exciting. Um, and, and what is I, their style like? Because they're not from the U.S. I, I want to make that clear because they are very much international, which is yeah. cool, which is cool in many ways. And it's nice to see them. And it's sort of a treat for, for, for us Americans who are watching. Well, I knew I was going to be like doing a tryout for Japan. So working with That's Charlie, I know she has like Japanese influence. So I was immediately like, let's do Japanese style. Like let's uh, get in, brawl and like all these crazy stuff. Um, uh, Jessica, she's definitely like so elegant. Like everything she does is so pretty in the ring. So pretty. And she's just like her arm bars, the way she gets into them is amazing. I think they work so good as a tag team too because they're so funny. They're not, like, serious. They're just, like, they're barely good at, like, talking to the crowd and, like, pandering the entire time. Yeah, and, and I really enjoyed these title defenses. I, I enjoyed the Solo and Willow match a lot. And I want to talk about these belts because my favorite thing you did with these belts were technically not defending them, but bringing them into beyond. So... And correct me if the story is wrong. I'm going to give some background because some people might not know this. So you win the belts, I think, on a Friday or a Saturday, from my understanding. And then pretty much on Thursday for Uncharted Territory Season 2, you show up at Beyond. I think I think that, that same week or within that same week. And then you have the belts with you. And yes. it's announced that you have the belts. We see the belts. And what was that like? Because it's kind of cool that you got to wear the belts, hold the belts, get to show the belts on indie wrestling, on, on a major indie wrestling promotion that is not Shimmer, <laughs> which is kind of <laughs> cool. It was announced that you won it there, and we don't get to see that. So what was that entire thing like? Because it's kind of a cool wrestling moment, and there's a lot of stuff that probably went into it behind the scenes. But it was a lot of good, probably, promotion for a lot of people in that, just on the business side of things, I would imagine. So I feel like Beyond, because of WWR, ended up becoming like our home promotion um, in a way. So it was kind of like going home with the titles, like with the big win. Like, I guess how Brady feels going to Boston for the duck boats, except on a smaller scale. But like, it's big for me. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we got permission to take the belts home. Um, so that was cool. That's not like a normal thing for Shimmer to do to let you take the belt with you. Um, but they let me, Ashley, and Hyen take the belts. And they're like, yeah, like, bring them out to shows. Like, walk out with it. Put it on your merch table. Like, show people that you have the belts. And we were like, what? Like, us? <laughs> so we got to go with the belts. Um and I think as soon as it was announced that we won the titles, Drew messaged us for the Wednesday Uncharted Territory show. And me and Ashley were like, we we're bruised from Shimmer Weekend. And we were just like, we have to do it. <laughs> like, we have to muster on and do it. So we said yes. And then, like, showing up, like, everyone was already, like, pushing us, like, congratulations. And, like, I think it was good for the crowd because they got to see and like touch the belts at like at the end of the show and I don't know I liked it <laughs> and it was probably good promotion for Shimmer too because Beyond during that time was doing I think somewhere in like 30 to 50 thousand views a week just on, oh, on wow. indie from my understanding they were doing a lot and they did they're doing they were doing if they were going up against Monday Night Raw currently, they probably would have kicked Monday Night Raw's ass. <laughs> and they might, if whenever it comes back, they very well might, the way things are going at the moment, because it's a big deal. And then Beyond and their Wednesday or Thursday night show now does very, very well, um, considering all things. And Beyond has some amazing talent. 
and I'm biased on one of the matches. It's in my contract, I promise. Um, but you have to face Bear Country, which is sort of the aces of Beyond, to Infinity and Beyond. You know, Woody and Buzz Lightyear for you right there. I wonder where they got the name from, you know. This little thing, you know. Um, great, great, great movie. I don't know if I could say it, though. Um, I'm biased on AG because I love Anthony Green and the Platinum Honeys. But you got to have Shark Boy in your corner, which made complete sense. Because of yeah. Anthony Vox. It made complete sense in your, your tag team name. And then you also got to face Sierra and the Top Dogs, which is uh, Skylar Hot Scoops and Davian. And so clearly the people that I just named on the indies, if you're a big indie fan, those probably eight, nine people are big and are big deals. And if you don't know who they are, you clearly should go out and watch some indie wrestling. Seven, eight people. Oh, okay. I, clearly we're doing this because I'm not a math guy. Me neither. I said this was seven. <laughs> so, 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 but my point still stands. What was that like that you got some serious indie comp at Beyond? Bruised, battered, tag team champs. Because it's kind of cool, and, and Beyond is a big deal in, in many ways. You know, after 10 years, they're kind of one of the biggest indie promotions, and that game changing wrestling is the second or first, depending on how you're counting. But those are the two biggest. Right now in the indie scene, hands down. So what was it like yeah. getting to wrestle there and and to show off those belts and wrestle with these guys and girls? Um, an, an animal, an animal, an animal. I want to make it clear. I don't discriminate I feel like here. The uncharted territory shows are a lot more like uh, anxiety driven than a normal Beyond show because of the TV time. Like we have a certain amount of streaming time, so you are kind of. But they broke their own rules. That, 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 that's, level. that's so BS. They broke their own rules with the David Starr match. Did they? They yell at us. <laughs> they didn't yell cool. at David Starr when he did it. Who did he wrestle? Uh, Merce uh, Mercedes, Mercedes Martinez. And they went for like 45 minutes over at the end of the show. And they just kept streaming it. It was great. It was, it was, it was an amazing match. It's an amazing match. It just kept going. I'm calling it. I think they planned for that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they planned for that, too. They probably bought more time. <laughs> they were like, put it on our credit card. <laughs> they might have even been paid to, to do it even longer, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but, like, getting back to, to, to Beyond here. Because I love uh, Beyond. I love Beyond. I think I think it's it's brilliant what they've done. Beyond has has clearly been granted a very good license and they are very much a threat to, to other companies at the moment. I would even make the argument to some degree they're not an ultra threat, but but they are definitely not not a baby anymore, for lack no, of a better no. word. Um, uh, it's great to see them go from like the company that everyone kind of like looked down on because they did like over the top things and now it's like them being one of the top promotions like you said in america right now at the moment i have the world um, i would make the argument in the world i, I really would uh, on the indie scene i would make that argument because yeah everybody wants to be in beyond or game changer right now undeniably i mean american rana did 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 all got a lot of views got a lot of views when they did it in 2019 and rightfully so and yeah. you, you had johnny impact before we went back to the wrestling at american rana it's not a coincidence it's not a coincidence. It's it's he wanted to be there. Ethan Page is wrestling and beyond. He wants to be wrestling there when he can. Gary J. I, I mean, I, I I I know so much about this, but this is about you, not them. So continue, no, please. No, ask you questions. <laughs> Who else do you want to see there? <laughs> oh man, I want to see Lee Moriarty there. That that would be fantastic. And I would like Give to see Joey spot back. Next time for you. <laughs> I would like to see ACH a would be good there, and Lee Moriarty, and um, yeah, de definitely those those people. Um, but anyway, this is not about me. This is about you. So, and, and also also getting getting to, to to you know even when you were wrestling Sierra and the Top Dogs, Layla Hurst was was, was also in that match, and so. You 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 know her very well, and so what was that like, and and all that stuff, and. 
That was I think that was like the funnest match because it was just girls versus girls. Like we get so many intergender opportunities at Beyond that sometimes when you do have like an all girls match, you feel like you get to show what you can do, like what you're capable of. It's kind of like um, I know how people like shit on intergender and they're always like, oh, the girl's only that good because like the guy is helping her. But like in that sense, when we do have girls versus girls real life no we are good like we are capable and it's like we don't need training wheels or like no guys helping us look good like it's so, us just but let's good. let's talk about that match because was that the match that sort of involves some merch table stuff also because because i know that match definitely showed off and introduced sierra into yes. the pond and and very much at, at that point i think layla hurst was was becoming bigger and she she was becoming, getting invited to Germany and wrestling a lot in Germany. And she was getting a lot of attention, wrestling a variety of guys and other women. And she was getting a platform. The two of you, you and Ashley Vox, were obviously sort of getting, I guess, reintroduced into Beyond. And people knew who you were, but you, you were back and you were on multiple shows at that point. And so... What was that like? Because in many ways, I viewed this match as lifting up Sierra and getting her attention and giving her a boost. And that's kind of a cool thing in many ways when you get to give somebody else an opportunity, but not necessarily take away from you or bury yourself yeah. to it, which I thought was done really well in this circumstance with this. So right. what was that like? It, 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 unfortunately, in wrestling, sometimes, you know, you mentioned you stopped watching wrestling when Cena was winning and back in the day to bring this full circle, he was burying a lot of people. It was necessary to some degree, but it also, he buried a lot of people in WWE. And that, that, that's an issue in wrestling sometimes. So what was that like not doing that? Um, I think we piecing together the match. We kept that in mind. Um, I ended up having like her moment where she got to have like a lot of offense in the ring ended up being with me. Because I knew I could like uh, base her for things that she wanted to do for her offense and like feed really well for her. Um, we gave her the big high spot with the dive, which I'm glad came off really good. And she got to be the one to do all the pins <laughs> after the big uh, superplex spot. Um I think I wish she hadn't gotten injured because I do miss working with her. Uh, she did get injured uh, at a show. And then because of the level of injury it was, like it could have been so much worse. She kind of is taking a break from wrestling right now. now I'm probably going to wait till she finish, finishes college maybe and see if she wants to revisit it later. Um that is one sad thing because we did love Sierra and we loved having her as like the top puppy or like the little puppy in the top dogs. Um, but now we have the girls room with Brie, with Skylar, <laughs> Davey and uh, Ava. So we're hoping to do another version of that match with like me, Ash and Layla and then girls room and hopefully like keep doing those matches. We just want to wrestle each other. <laughs> Those are like, when you wrestle your friends, those are like the most fun matches. And speaking about when you wrestle your friends, you know, Triple H has said it about Shawn Michaels that you get to hit your friends the hardest. And yes. me, me and my friends, obviously, we're not wrestlers, but we, we hurt each other in different ways. And we say horrific things to each other. And people look at me and my friends and say, how can you say that to each other? And they don't understand that. You can do things with your friends that you can't do with other people that are beyond offensive, that are inside jokes to your friends. So what is that like with you? And I don't want to say you hit your friends the hardest or you hurt your friends the hardest. That's not how I want this to be misinterpreted. But you could do other things or high-flying spots that you wouldn't do with somebody else in a ring. Or you could put together something that is somewhat different than what you would do with, you know... I can't think of another wrestler who is not, you're not close to as much yeah. as Ashley Vox or Layla Hurst or Davey Ann or Skyler or Sierra or a few others. So what what is that like when you're wrestling your friends and having that ability to put something together that 
really normally wouldn't be put together with somebody else because of that trust level that's thrown out there. Yeah, I think uh, you just end up putting together something more complex because you have that level of like comfort, trust. You've probably worked them a few more times, so you already know their shtick or like what their stuff is. Um, we had been having the opportunity to have like taped matches being released through Limitless Wrestling right now um, on IWTV. So we wrestled, the first tag match they released was us against Waves and Curls. That was our first time ever meeting them. So it is kind of like a very mild tag match. Like we just do like the most that we can do because it was our first time ever meeting them and working with them and seeing them wrestle. Um, whereas we wrestle Davy and Ava Taker. Uh, it's going to be released Wednesday next week. And that match is just, we murder each other. <laughs> it's fun, but we murder each other on like certain things. There's like opening spot. Uh, you have to watch it because there's just murder. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. You're going to, you're going to see it and you're going to be like, Oh, uh, they hate each other, but it's no, we're friends, so we trust each other to do certain things. Yeah, and let, let's talk about that because that kind of brings us to COVID and changes in wrestling and things being done. Obviously, a lot of pre taping is happening. You know, I asked, I had Facade, who's a wrestler. I don't know if you know who Facade is, but Facade's been around for a while. 14 Not personally. Years. Um, he's the Neon Ninja. He's great, and he's a fun guy to interview, and really enjoyed it. It was last Monday. Self promotion here, um, but we were speaking about changes in wrestling and how COVID has changed things. Obviously, Limitless is doing pre tape matches. I think Limitless has done wrestlers acting as fans, much like the WWE has done, but they did it first, which I hope Limitless is getting credit for it at the very least. Um, no, actually, I think Beyond did, because Beyond did the tapings back when they... <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, I stand corrected, <laughs> but what do you feel is going to be changing in wrestling and how things are done and what promotions are doing, because obviously COVID has definitely fucked shit up, I want to say, yeah. to, to put it nicely. I, I don't know yep. if there's another word. No. It, COVID. It, 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 it's one of those things that just kind of happened. It messed up WrestleMania week. As we know, I think 1920 shows were supposed to happen as far as indie goes. And so how, how have you been affected, A, as far as wrestling? And then B, what changes do you think need to happen? And then C, what, what do you think? This looks like going forward because right now Beyond is doing a lot of outside shows. They're doing a lot of shows that um, GCW is doing a lot of outside shows. There's one in SummerSlam weekend, I guess, for, for lack of a better word for that, or SummerSlam Day, which is probably going to be better than SummerSlam. Both, both those double headers. GCW's uh, Jimmy Lloyd's Jersey Shore is going to be much better than SummerSlam by far. Um, and then Beyond. Uh, something sun sun lotion or suntan lotion. I, I forget the name. Where's sunscreen? Where's sunscreen? It's, it's going to be a good yeah. show too. Um, but what do you think needs to happen for both wrestlers to feel safe and fans to feel safe? And where do you think it's all going with all that stuff? I know it's a long question. I know it's a long question. Um. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't know. In Japan, I was there like right when corona was kind of happening so what we did was um right before they had to stop wrestling uh, doing shows everyone who like entered the door had to get hand sanitizer and then they would sit down if they left and came back in they had to use hand sanitizer um everyone wore a mask um even the wrestlers when they were at the merch table they had to wear a mask so i mean and that was like for a venue venue like an actual building that you were going to sit inside. They didn't do space seating because it was such a small concept in Japan at the moment. Like it wasn't as big as it was happening in America. Um, I'm not sure. I like the outdoor shows. However, we are going to be getting into the cold months 
relatively we soon. Up, and the in facade, we're speaking about that. Where what? Yeah, happens like come October. I, don't know. You know, you know, I, I feel comfortable September. doing tapings. Yeah, like that was good. They checked our temperature before we entered the building each day, and um, we were just like, you know, wash your hands. They wipe the ring down every in between matches. They wipe the mats down in between matches. Everyone wore a mask if they were around the ring. And how, how, have the tape, <laughs> how, how have the tapings affected you? Because are they doing wrestlers acting as fans during those tapings? Because I know some of them yeah. come out. It's it's Road to Limitless, right? The Road, yeah. And so and so I know episodes one and two are out. Is three out yet, or is that next week? Uh, three came out last night, and then they already put out the replay. So, so, obviously, we we have three out. Next week is four. Just, just, I mean, we're, we're not giving anything proprietary away here. No. Just, just, uh, just so if this comes back to me or it comes back to you, um, on that matter, I just want to make that crystal clear. So, how how is it to though wrestle in a taping? Because it's very different. It's it, it's very different when you don't have fans. It's very different even when you're simulating fans and also merch and all that stuff. And it's a very different environment from my understanding. And there's a psychological aspect to that that I would imagine that allows you to do other things in a match. You know, you know, you know Botchamania can't really happen. No, they don't let us retape. Oh, oh, that. snap. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking that because there's like, certain things that happen i'm like why can't we retape like i don't get it like if cause the first time that i watched Pendum and get the dojo i'm like if i was wrestling on a tapings i would speak up and be like i'm sorry i messed that up can i redo it like you would think they'd let you retape but they don't it's just it's crazy good luck um i would say the downside of not having fans is the adrenaline's gone so you feel every bump like normally I'd call like a power bump in a match, a power bump in a match and be fine getting up from it. But like when you take that in front of no one, <laughs> you're just like, I have to get off. <laughs> you just feel everything much more because there's no like excitement about it. You're kind of just doing your job. Do you feel that social media, though, in that circumstance is even more powerful? Because at this point, the the, the fan base now or at least the the fan base that's not wrestlers pretend to be fans or, or watching the match as wrestlers is now social media and now social media has become the fan base because people tweet out about this stuff. I, I'm one of them. Not every wrestling thing, you know, I haven't seen Limitless yet just because I'm swamped with a lot of stuff. <laughs> I was actually prepping up this interview last night. I would have been, been watching. Um, but I digress where... Do you feel though that the the social media is almost a new critic on all this stuff and is is covering it and how ha- like I'm, I'm sure you get notifications right like so how does that impact it I guess post after because you can't really check your phone in the middle of the match but did a great job with that power bomb right there I got you like it right here in the middle of the match. <laughs> Maybe you should. Maybe you should. I think it'd be hilarious if you did, but... I, so, yeah, that's one thing is, like, normally if you have a match at a show, like, BC, before Corona, um, you would get feedback, like, immediate feedback, because if you did something cool, like, the fans would react to it. you you know, generate that reaction. And then when you'd go to your merch table, people would tell you, good job. Oh, I like this. Oh, that was cool. Like, they would tell you something. So you got immediate feedback. However, with wrestlers, I feel like it's, like, a very common idea that we're, like, these beings that are sensitive and, like, we need constant reformation. I don't know what the word is. (laughs) Like, we need constant, like, applause. Otherwise, we don't know what to do with ourselves. Like, I have these matches. I don't know if they're good because no one tells me they are. Randy posted them, so I'm assuming he thought they were good. (laughs) Um... But, like, I just, I don't know. I don't get that immediate, like, satisfaction of having the match. Even, like, after the first match on the tapings I had was against Rip Bison. Like, it was so funny. Like, I got pinned. And then after, like, a few seconds, I, like, got up. And I was, like, thinking of all the things I did wrong. Like, hmm, 
I'm like, oh, man, I wish that was cleaner. I wish this was, <laughs> instead of just like enjoying the moment and doing the whole like, oh, thank you. <laughs> and then walking to the vet. And then obviously, since it's pre-taped and then it's delayed a week or two weeks later after it's been filmed, you're not even getting the reaction to it because it's then streamed as a premiere mm -hmm. later. So, so... I don't know when, when if it's a two-week taping or if it's a week taping ahead of time or if they do three of your matches in a row all at the same time. But obviously, I don't know if I'm allowed to say. I'm, I'm going to say it. We, but, 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 but obviously, we, obviously it's pre-taped, so you're not getting yes. the immediate feedback and you get it a week or two weeks later. And so that, that must be such an odd experience because it's like, getting like a, a performance review at your job like, 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 like a quarterly performance yeah. review like that's the, that's the only thing i can think of so how is that when you've had time to dwell on it and then a fan points something out or that you're seeing you're like oh i did something really cool oh that was two weeks ago or that was three days ago like what what is that experience like because it's almost looking back and it forces you to look back and i would imagine relive it again because you just said you Say, oh man, I did ten things wrong, and then people are saying, "Great power bomb!" Like a week later, yeah. <laughs> just, just, just as an example. <laughs> um, I think it's like it's good because, like, I kind of miss wrestling because of how like far the tapings were to now. Then I'm like, oh, like I miss being in the ring. But then when a match gets released of mine, so far I've had two out of four matches released. Um, it's like, oh, yeah, I have, like, wrestling content. Or, like, I can see myself wrestling and, like, I'm active. Like, it's almost like you're not just, like, sitting at home, working out, doing your daily quarantine ritual. You're just like, oh, yeah, I have a wrestling match out. Like, a new, I don't know how to explain it. But it's like I'm doing something with my life <laughs> other than, like, not wrestling right now. I feel you now. I don't want to go any further with this because I got a feeling I'm going to pull stuff out of you. And uh, you and me are both <laughs> going to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> you probably more than me. So I'm probably just going to be blacklisted from interviewing anybody from Limitless ever again. But I I'm digress. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just have to stay with Beyond then and uh, go go to the Midwest because they still like me there. But but that, that, that that's neither here nor there. And... and I, I do want to talk a little bit about Japan because we mentioned Japan and obviously you came, went to Japan. I'm assuming you got invited to wrestle there and you wrestled a bunch of people there. And so what was that like? And I think, I think you, you went with Masha Slamovich, what was there with you and yes. you were wrestling Mikoto Shindo, Natsu Samori. Kiori, Kioru, Nan, Nami. My, my, I, I'm not saying these names. Clearly, clearly, no. I have a hard time saying all these names. But I think you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> so, what was this like? And having these matches, and even being in Japan. And obviously, you mentioned that COVID kind of was hitting at that time. And obviously, Japanese culture as a whole. I'm a big anime fan, and I'm very familiar with their culture. It's very different than the U.S. It's very different than the U.K. It's very different than Canada and even Mexico. And so what was that experience like from culturally, how they view wrestling, how they respect wrestling, how they res have a view on women's wrestling and men's re wrestling and how the crowd responds, if that even applies, because I don't know what COVID was affecting in that regard. Um. Well... So we had a tryout for Marvelous, and at the tryouts, me and Masha actually had our tryout match together, and so we ended up both getting picked, which is cool. Um, that was the first time we met in person was at the tryout, and then when we got to Japan, it was just like, we were like together all the time. We were like best friends. We were training partners. We were trained after training was over. Um, we would do like everything together, like travel and like get in trouble um <laughs> and so it was a good mix because she was really like street smart because she's from new york so she just understands how to get around a city very easily even though it's a different language like she could like memorize streets 
and I could speak like very small Japanese because I took it in high school. So we were a force to be reckoned with <laughs> and we got a lot, we got away with a lot more than we should have. Um, <laughs> going back to like the wrestling, it was just like a lot of fun. Um, going to Japan and wrestling in Japan was my like dream when I first started training they were like oh what do you want to do everyone always says like oh wwe i was like i want to go to japan i didn't understand how big and like respected it was over there at the time i was just like i love japan like i want to go there <laughs> but um i'm really glad i got to do it i know not everyone gets the opportunity to go to japan i know there's a lot of people who are still trying to so i'm glad i got to do that and i felt like there was like an amount of not pressure but like kind of pride for everyone who like trained me and like put some sort of like influence on me and I was just kind of like you have to kind of like hold yourself up and like be at a certain level to wrestle in Japan and I was really glad that I got to be one of those people and the matches that I had were all so fun um each one was like a different puzzle to put together because of the language barrier but like once you like get it it's just like in a small place in your heart like I think I remember my matches in Japan more than I'll memorize matches that I've had here because some of them kind of feel repetitive but like over there each one was like its own character and what do you feel was the biggest takeaway from those matches and being there and learning because Japan for everybody that I've spoken to on the indie side has changed the way they approach wrestling, how they view wrestling, how they understand wrestling. And it really is a game changer because it's such a different setting and it's viewed so differently. So what was your biggest takeaway when you came back to the state side? And I understand it might not be blossoming yet because of COVID because it kind of all happened and then wrestling kind of stopped. But I'm sure that there's a lot of stuff that has impacted you from the matches that you had there. Um, I think my style before, like Japan, I wrestled kind of like smaller than what my size actually is. I know you don't think I'm big, but I'm actually big. It's not a big, that's throwing shade right there. I know you called me small, so... It was now your I political was option. Boss. It was the political option. I'm sure I'm sure you could hurt me in a ring. I'm sure of it. <laughs> now I feel like because I was bigger in the ring in Japan than I against most of the girls, I got to wrestle at like a bigger girl level. So now I have that influence behind me, in case you were wondering. <laughs> so now I think I wrestle more like a bigger opponent would. Because I am. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. If you watch the tapings, you would know, but you haven't. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, on that note, I'm going to give you an opportunity to promote yourself, because we already spoke about COVID, and I know we didn't get to speak about sabotage or... or, or, or the, the, the other promotion that... that, that, was that that, that you just, just uh, wrestled for, which is Battle Club Pro. And you obviously are heavier for that because in both of Thank those you. places you want some belts. But we're going to table that after that response. <laughs> but I, I, I definitely want to give you an opportunity to promote yourself. Where can people find you on social media? You know, Twitter, Facebook page, right Instagram, merch. Um, or should where, where can people support you as well? Uh, I have Twitter and Instagram, and they're both at DelmiXO, D-E-L-M-I-E-X-O. And then uh, merch, I just had 8x10s sell out, um, but I'm going to be doing pre-orders in case anyone's interested. And then I'll be posting some t-shirts that I found. I'm probably going to do like tie-dye. So that'll be a fun project. And can, 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 you, can you mention anywhere where you're wrestling? Um or, or, or what promotions you frequent, for, for lack of a better word, just so people uh, can be on the lookout, because I'll explain why, just so everybody understands. So right now, 
with tapings and COVID, things are uncertain exactly. Mm -hmm. And cards are subject to change beyond just had a show that popped up. Legitly, they had a show that popped up, I think, like six days ago. So clearly things things are never set in stone. I know that you had a few limitless shows come out and I know that they're doing on the road and that's a lot of pre taping, but what if you can mention anything where where are you gonna be or what promotions do you frequent so that people can look those up and sort of get an idea of where you might be popping up? So yeah. Besides uh, the tapings with Limitless that are popping up on IWTV every Wednesday at 7. Um, fingers crossed, Battle Club might be running in September. So hopefully, if everything gets established correctly, they'll be announcing a September date. So me and Ashley will be there with the belts, of course. And uh, hopefully, that's uh, as far as our calendar is set. <laughs> That's all we got. And where, where where do you frequent as far as promotions go? So maybe we mentioned uh, a bunch of them, but just so that people get an idea that if they go on IWTV and they type in a promotion, you know, where, where can they type in a promotion that you um, frequent? Beyond Wrestling, the Uncharted Territory series, we're on there already. And then Beyond starting to run, so maybe within, like, a few weeks we'll be on like maybe another show of theirs um we do wrestle for sabotage down in texas uh shimmer has been like messing around with the idea of running but they're still laying low because of things in chicago and i i think it was going back up again the cases so that's on hold but shimmer um AWS in California, we've had opportunities to work with, and I would say that's it for now, only because I'm not sure what other promotions are planning on doing with, like, running. Well, we'll, we'll leave it there, but, but I've been saying it with everybody, and I'm sure everybody on my Facebook page is sick of it, but I've been saying, obviously, you have to support indie if you have a few extra bucks around. You know, definitely consider buying a T-shirt. Consider buying an 8x10 if somebody's got it. Consider buying something from a wrestler or Delny if you really like what she's doing. And you check this match. It's definitely consider buying a T-shirt or an 8x10 or anything. And if you don't have money, you should be following people on social media. It's free. Following somebody on Twitter and commenting, checking out their Facebook page, their Instagram, commenting, liking a photo. It matters. It's important. It's important for algorithms. It's important for self-esteem. It's important for promoters. And I can keep going, but I think everybody gets the idea. And there's no excuse anymore because that's free. Because yeah. if you don't like- do it, that just means you're not caring and it's free to follow somebody on Twitter and the only reason why you shouldn't be doing that is if you don't have electricity or internet and if that's the case seriously please contact me and tell me how you're watching this because I would love to know I would love to know and and no no seriously call me and if you tell me how you're doing it without internet and electricity I will personally help you after you tell me how you're doing it the library Hopefully help you so that's the only excuse you have everybody social media is free because if you can't support somebody economically because you're taking care of your family or yourself you know free social media it's the way to go so that that's the only reason excuse wise is if you don't have electricity or internet that, that's everything else you have no excuse anymore and i'm not tolerating it and i don't know if anybody else is tolerating it but that's just a fact Good job. <laughs> that was great. Professional. <laughs> hey, yeah, this, this is how we are, everybody. We, we're, we're still live, and this is all professional. Oh. And that is the professional <laughs> stance right there. 11 years professional. 